fix all of this, but I have some ideas about where we can start. Um, prior to 2022, the biggest complaint about kids was that they just were not resilient. We had this population of kids who was overparented, overscheduled, overprotected. They didn't know how to overcome obstacles. They were used to being rewarded for everything they did. And so when I would get asked to write letters for college recommendations, the number one thing colleges always wanted to hear from me was, this kid's resilient. Tell me why. And I didn't always have a why. I didn't have a lot of kids that had necessarily faced a lot of really hard things. Many of them had. A lot of them hadn't, had not. Um, and I love this clip from Portlandia. If there's any Portlandia fans in here. Um, yes, <laughs> yay, okay, good, we'll talk later. Um, because I feel like this really does illustrate what kids were like. Can you, I need some volume if possible. Thank you. Can I help you? Hi, yes. I'm with the Surfrider Foundation, and I was hoping you would sign this petition to help us ban plastic bags in Oregon. I don't think I want to do that. Oh, a today. skeptic, okay. I think I need to read the appropriate literature before I sign anything. Okay. Here you, here you go. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Hello, Sarah. Hi, I'm Chris. How are you? That's our son, Alex. You just spoke right, to him before. Yeah. Could you just ex explain, help us to understand why you would sh shut the door on our son? I'm the type that I have to read it first, have it right in my brain, and then I'll decide. I'm yeah, but, but he's the type, and we're the type, that needs instant answers that's unfortunate it's actually fortunate because that's a way that a person learns you know what let's try it again let's try it again for alex's Hello, sake alex. okay nice to see you. Right, what was the name of your organization the, the surf rider foundation all right son you did that sounds you convincing did to me so good yeah. have you read the literature though that you're hey listen literature is one of those things that everyone knows i think you're gonna be fine what? as long as you know it. this kid's a good guy i'm sure he is and you know just sign it down you're nice. Thank you. Can I help you? Hi. I'm from the Surfrider Foundation. And well, I was my name is Alex. My name is Alex. Uh -huh. And I was hoping you would sign this petition to help us ban plastic bags in Oregon. Tell me more. Just making sure you're smiling at him. Tell me more. They cause pelican cancer. They don't cause pelican cancer. Who knows? Does it say it in there? They, 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 they do. Can you show me? Shrug. And that means what? Foot. That means it's for you to decide. He's doing pretty good. Well, not if he's telling people plastic bags cause pelican yeah, cancer. Let, let's try this. Just uh, move your mouth and I'll just, I'll okay. just do it for you. Okay. So, well, you look pretty great. I mean, I think everybody looks pretty great. I mean, people in general, they're always looking good and they're trying their best. <laughs> anyway, well, hey, listen, just sign it and let's get out of here. Get a life and stop smothering your child. I'm sorry. I, no, I failed. No, you didn't. You didn't. You didn't. Hi, I understand that my son and his wife were here because you wouldn't sign my grandson's petition. And I was just wondering why you won't sign the petition. I feel like I haven't done my job if they can't convince you that they, they did a good job, didn't they? Just sign it. Oh! Oh! I think we should go to ice cream. 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 Pistachio. Okay, it's funny because it's true, right? How many of you, I don't know my audience very well, how many of you are teachers in here and are in the classroom? Okay, so my favorite part of that is the make sure that you're smiling at him. I love that, if you give any feedback. Um, but that was what, what kids were kind of going through. We controlled everything they did as their adults. Um, even if you look at houses, houses that were built in the 1950s or earlier had kitchens that faced out front. That's where mom was, she did dishes, the kids were outside playing, they could be supervised. If you live in a house that was built later than that, I'm betting you, your kitchen is in the back. 
because we moved those kids to the backyard. And so mom could keep an eye on them there. We closed their world down. And so what we did was we created these kids who were vaguely afraid of things, but didn't have any concrete consequences. And then we all had a pandemic together. And so that's where we are right now. What's really hard to get around with a pandemic is we all went through it and we all experienced it, but no one experienced it the same as anyone else. Not within your family, not within your church, not within your school. Uh, when I go out to talk to different schools, it's always interesting because at my school, we were online that spring of 2020 like everybody else was. We planned to come back fully in person last year. We were ready to go, it was good. None of the public schools in Nevada were opening back up. 36 hours before the first day of school, the health district came back and said, no, you can go at 50% capacity, thinking that we would never figure it out. And so what we did is what church workers do, and we figured it out. And so I do the master schedule for the middle school. I have a counterpart. He's my work husband. He does the high school. So we sat down together, locked the door, and rescheduled the school to figure out how to build a hybrid schedule to be at 50% fire code. It sounds super heroic, but what happened, I remember it in kind of a montage when I think about it. Um, here's my super vulnerable, transparent moment. I am a nervous puker. I just am. I have a very nervous stomach. And so we had a day and a half locked in his office where every once in a while I would just throw up in the trash can and he would kind of pat me. And then we would get back to counting numbers. And that was what we did to open the school. Uh, it was a really fun story. So our kids, were able to come back full-time 100% in January. So my kids had mostly school last year. But we just had our mask mandate lifted last week. So the students in our school experienced some online, some hybrid, some in person, all of it masked. The kids in the public school experienced really very little school. Um, some of the, the, Clark County was allowed to run kind of however they wanted by school. So there were some buildings where if you checked in on a Google form once a week and showed proof of life, you got credit. There were other schools that did online school. So we take education out of it. Maybe you know someone who passed away. Maybe you don't know anyone who got very sick. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you don't know anyone who lost their job. As adults, and if you spend any time on the dumpster fire that is social media, you know this, the adults cannot reconcile that people had different experiences moving through the pandemic. And then we turn around and expect our kids to be able to do that. And so it's really kind of hard to come from that place. So we saw some weird impact. Increased anxiety, obviously. Increased school avoidance. They learned, well, we all learned, we don't have to leave the house, right? We can stay home. And so we have a lot of kids that really liked not having to face things and got very school avoidant. We're also in this place where if I announce that I feel like I have a sore throat, I'm not allowed to leave the house. And we have kids that figured that out as well. So we're dealing with a lot of kids who maybe were socially anxious, maybe had school avoidance issues, and now have just um, had that all exacerbated. Reentry was hard. They decreased their physical activity. They decreased their church involvement. Um, learning to do things again is difficult going back to the grind of school and practice and worship and youth group and all of the things that we used to do and not really think about it. Um, and they had an increased connection to online communities, which can be good and bad. I have a lot of kids at our school who are a little quirky, who struggled to find kids who shared their interests and found that community online and were actually really bolstered by that. Um, some of them did not find good communities online. And so that's been a challenge as well. Um, and so it really, though, interrupted their social life. So this, this is not very scientific. Like, don't take a picture of this. This is from my own experiences. But watching kids kind of move through how to grow up and have friends, we have those kindergarten and first grade, beginning play dates, second and third grade, family friends. Third through fifth, they get a little bit more independent. But if you think about it, if you have elementary age kids, their friends are who, their parents are your friends, or you know, right? That's kind of how social life goes when you're little and you can't drive and you don't have a whole lot of independence or real hobbies other than what I take you to. And then in sixth and seventh grade, we start to see those school friends develop. They're not real friendships. They're 
we have homeroom together, we have four classes together, we sat next to each other last year, so now we have lunch together forever because middle school lunchroom is nothing but a turf war, if you've ever been there. Like, you need to claim your spot and stay there. And then eighth and ninth, we start to see the common interests. Tenth and twelfth, we see independence. What the last year and a half has done is completely halted that. We went back to that elementary level because suddenly as parents, we had to navigate not only do I know this kid and do I like this kid, but is this kid's family doing the pandemic the same way that I am? Uh, I know people who are just now for the first time leaving their houses. They have hunkered down and hunkered down hard. And you know what? Their kids would not be welcome at my house where we've been kind of traipsing around and, and doing whatever since we got let out. Um, but as kids, the kids do not navigate that. They see it as rejection. And so it's been really helpful to be able to give kids that tool of your two friends didn't just stop hanging out with you. Their parents are very fearful. Someone was sick. Someone was impacted. They are not doing social things. This isn't about you. And for kids to have that toolbox, because remember, they grew up believing the whole world was about them because it was. They are the center of the universe. And so now to be able to look outside a little bit and to see that uh, maybe not, and maybe there are other things that go along. We had kids that lived a life online. That was when we were in lockdown uh, every day, Esther, oh, I don't know why that's doing that picture, but every day Esther would do a different class. And so that was her Zooming with her dog friends. Um, but they moved online, and so they moved into FOMO, FOBO, and FOMU, fear of missing out, fear of being offline, and fear of messing up. And so they're now in a world where everything they do can be screen recorded, it can be documented, it can be shared, it can be sent out, all of our friends are on social media, and so it was a whole lot more pressure. And then they also had to deal with, like we said, social media is not great, online is not great, and now we have these kids who are embroiled in po political information, people arguing about things, things that they're hearing at home that may go against it, and we're seeing divisiveness even among younger kids because of that. I think the hardest part, though, is we never really got to have a sick day again because now that everything is so accessible online, if you stay home, there's a feeling that you're still supposed to be dialed in. And so I've had to kind of have that struggle with parents where I have some kids who are school avoidant, but then on the other spectrum, I have kids who are genuinely sick who believe they're supposed to be dialed in when they're at home because they did online school. That is a lot of pressure to not even be able to have a sick day. And so we have to work through, stay home. Your homework will be here. Get better. Remember 2019 when we would just get strep throat and go home, and then we would come back when we felt better? It's okay. And it's okay to be offline, and it's okay to be unplugged. And honestly, you have to. So I'm going to give you a second with someone around you that maybe you don't know, and I promise we won't do a lot of this because I hate this when people make me do it, but just this one time, with someone around you, share what your pandemic experience was, if you could sum it up in two sentences. I know that's tough, try. Okay, you can squeeze in like two more sentences and then we're gonna come back together. Okay, did anybody find anybody who had exactly the same experience? 
probably not quite. One of the things that I would hear from kids a lot was this made the annoying stuff hard, the hard stuff more difficult, and the stuff that was already difficult totally impossible. We just saw this shift in the stuff that I used to be able to do easily, I can't anymore. And the stuff that used to be hard, I don't even have the confidence to attempt. And then we add to it, kids and adults alike, we are out of emotional reserve. And so I don't know if you've had this day, but I, but I will own it. I already told you that I throw up in trash cans at work where something will happen and, and I will have to kind of stop and think, why is this so upsetting to me? This isn't a big deal. Why am I mad? Well, I don't have anything left some days. This is exhausting. And so the kids definitely feel that too. And we see that in behavior and in acting out. And we see that in their parents and their behavior and their acting out. And we'll get to that. Like I have a solution for that, I think. I do want to deal in hope here. I think that when we, when we circle up and we talk about all of the things that these kids have lost and all of the things that we have lost, it's really hard. But when we look at what they can gain from it, it's really hopeful and encouraging. If you have not read The Pandemic Population by Tim Elmore, I highly recommend it. And I'm gonna post all of this into the app once I figure out how. Um, and so you'll be able to access everything I have. There's some websites and some other things down the road. But he does this really cool job of comparing this Gen Z to the silent generation, where the experience was very, very similar. This economic slump, increase in suicide rates, food scarcity that hadn't existed before, unemployment, things like that. And that's, we're gonna circle back to that, but I wanna draw that comparison first. What the silent generation did right, they were humble, they were grateful. We're gonna talk about grateful because grateful isn't always helpful, right? They were good workers, kind, resilient, resourceful. They knew as children that they were not the center of the universe. The family life did not revolve around the children of that generation in a good way. They saw themselves as part of the community because it wasn't all about them. And do you know how you survive crisis? In a community. Our kids are going to learn to survive in a community. I'm very encouraged by that. They learned how to make the best of things. They learned how to work. They learned that they had a support system. They learned how to use it. And they learned how to be resilient. Now, as we're facing this kind of crisis in church workers, I don't know if any other schools are trying to hire right now, but man, it is scarce. Like people are not going into church work. This is hopeful to me. If we are gonna have kids that are gonna learn, I need a community and I need a support and I need a foundation because this is hard, we have a generation that we can raise up. And I am so excited about that. We just have to get them there and we can do it. So when we help our kids recover, this is, uh, we have the Mark 10, 14 program at Faith. It's for students with uh, developmental disabilities. And sometimes they just kind of, we can't face the day. And so Esther will go down there and help. And so this is Esther and Elena. Elena was having a tantrum. And so Esther came to try to help with that. She's really good at laying there. So that was really a moment for her to shine. Uh, when we talk about practical strategies, first and foremost, the best thing we can do with our kids is check in with them. And the teachers at Faith are so good about this and they incorporate it in so many different ways. And I'm gonna show you a way to do it on your way out. But um, they use the bell ringers, they use their prayer journals, they use prayer requests, they use private journals, and just really teaching kids to kind of stop and say, how am I really? What emotion actually is this? What do I need and who do I need it from? If we can teach them to do those four things, we're gonna have kids that are gonna be able to emotionally regulate themselves and they're also gonna be able to advocate, which is really cool. We run an SOS screening, which is a suicide screening. Um, we, we figured out how to kind of screen 2,000 kids in one day and then we just triage through everyone that flags on it. And it has a depression index on it as well, but we keep that available year round. And so the kids at our school have learned that that's a really good way to get my attention is later on in the year, access the screening, be really honest about how they feel, and now the conversation has started. And there's, a, there's just different ways we can do that. Um, we have teachers that will let kids leave them a note if they wanna talk, super simple. But just ways for them to say, I need some help, when they don't know how to say that. We also wanna talk about 
big people problems versus smaller people anxiety. The pandemic really made this rough because our kids were suddenly privy to a lot of adult problems. And a lot of times they weren't privy to the total adult problem, which they shouldn't be. But little people with partial information catastrophize like nobody's business. And so if you share a conversation of, I'm a little stressed, your dad's job is doing layoffs, I will have a kid in my office two hours later who has now gone to the place of, I'm not gonna be able to go to school here anymore, we're gonna lose our house, we're not gonna be able to feed our dog, everyone's homeless, and so then we have to kind of dial back. And so we wanna be able to acknowledge with the kids what's hard, what is frustrating, what's unknown. We don't wanna share the exact details because they will make it their problem. Uh, and we want to not share just enough that they're able to take it and run with it. Um, we practice a lot with the kids what we call walking the room, and so we're gonna do that together, okay? You get, you're gonna love it. You guys all look super stoked. You should. This is a really good time, okay? You will feel better about this if you close your eyes, I promise. When I have kids that come in and they say, I'm stressed and I don't know why, we have to figure out what part of life is stressful. And so we're gonna picture your life like a house, and we're gonna go scale of one to 10. One is absolutely the pits I could lay down on this floor right now, and 10 is rainbows and unicorns, and I am killing it, all right? So if you think about it, and if you close your eyes, because you're gonna hold a finger or two or 10, hopefully 10 up, if you think about your life right now in regards to your job and what your responsibilities are, the, the grind of it, where are you at? All right, I also have terrible vision, so don't worry about me coming back and knowing what you said, because I really can't see very far. All right, when you think about work, as far as your relationships, the people that you're around, the energy that surrounds you, where are you at? All right, if you think about your home life, when you walk in that door, and that, that energy and that space and those people that greet you, where are you at? All right, when you think about where you're at in your faith, it's okay to be honest, I won't even look. Where are you at? All right, a lot of confidence in this room, I like that. All right, and then the last one, when you think about, and this is the hard one, yourself, how you've handled things, where you're at right now, how you're treating those around you, where are you at? Sweet, okay, we'll move on. So when you do that with kids, all of a sudden we've taken something terrible is coming and I don't know what, down to either things really aren't that bad or this area is a one, so this is a problem. And now we can start to work on dealing with it. Little people cannot decipher down why they feel bad. And so this helps them kind of combat that. Because they were socially stunted, we have to assume they need help. We just have to. So when someone comes home and it was a terrible day and they are being bullied and someone was looking at them, which my answer to that is always like, well, why were you looking at them to know they were looking at you? You were looking too, right? We're all looking. But they're, they're struggling to process social interaction because they missed out on a lot of it. They cannot read nonverbal cues because you don't do that online. And if you are in an environment like I was where you were masked, you lost the chance. I have spent the last 20 months telling kids, I'm not mad. Stop trying to read my eyebrows. This is just how I look, okay? But we lost the ability to connect with kids that way. They don't know if we're smiling. They don't know if we're happy. And they don't know how to read those nonverbals. They've never been able to set their own emotional barometer. So when they come home and they erupt, Oftentimes they feel better because they got it out, right? But if they come home and erupt and you match it, well now we're all in crisis, right? Now everybody's upset and the child has learned this should be really upsetting. I should be really worried. We're doing a lot of practicing right now with what's the truth versus what's the story that's in your head. Is the truth that everybody hates you and you have no friends and you need to transfer schools and stay home and homeschool? Or is the truth you and your best friend had an argument and the rest of your group is weird because they don't know how to handle it because they're 12 
and they don't know how to handle much, and we maybe just need to mediate it, that's probably the truth. But we need to be able to talk through that. They also do not know how to initiate social interaction because we have to practice it. It sounds so simple, but I will have kids in my office where we have to literally role play through that. How would you ask someone to go see a movie? We're not gonna text it. You've done enough of that. How would you say that? Do you wanna go to a movie on Saturday? And if they say I can't, I'm busy, how do we handle that not as a rejection of me, but maybe, okay, they're busy, and we can try it again later. They lost a lot of practice at a really crucial time. So, we can do, oh, did we lose something in here? Uh-oh, I'm missing some slides, you guys. They were really good ones, too. We're gonna talk about mindfulness in the classroom briefly, and I will, like I said, I'll load this into the app. Um, how many of you have heard this saying, depression is the past, anxiety is the future? Have you heard that before? That got real popular on social media for a while, right? Or if you're, if you're depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. And so it was posted a lot, and it was always credited to Lao Tzu, a Chinese Taoist, and it was supposed to be this Eastern way of thinking. It's actually not. This is a fun story. You're gonna wanna save this for later because it's a, it's a good over dinner. You're gonna sound super smart. Everybody thinks it's this Eastern thinking. It actually came from a Christian pastor as a part of a sermon that he did on a radio show. And the quote that he said was, live in the now. When I am anxious, it is because I am living in the future. When I am depressed, it is because I am living in the past. We crucify ourselves between two thieves, regret for yesterday and fear of tomorrow. And the pastor who said that, this is good, was actually Reverend Run of Run DMC. If you're a Walk This Way fan, yeah? Okay. He was actually the one that said that. But we do want to teach the kids how to live in the present and how to not be anxious about the future or worried about the past. If you are in the classroom, I'm going to share some mindfulness activities with you. If you choose to do them, or if you're running a youth group, or if you're running a Sunday school, or if you gather a lot of children in your home for some reason, <laughs> these are all things that you can do. I encourage you if you do that, though. We want to keep it positive. We never want to have any kind of calmness or meditation or peacefulness feel like a punishment. Um, I have had teachers who have tried to use it that way. Uh, the class was really out of control and they were talking back and they were nasty and so I turned the lights off and said, fine, we're gonna get quiet. Well, that doesn't really de-escalate anyone, right? So we need to kind of set the tone beforehand, begin to quiet it, begin to calm down. There are some sound meditations out there that are really fantastic. Um, does anybody know the difference between prayer and meditation? Oh, that's a hard one. Any, anybody want to get real brave? No? Yes. Okay, prayers to God and meditations to yourself. I like that. And yeah, it's close. Really what we want is prayer tends to be active, right? I'm engaged and I'm, I'm speaking to God and I'm receiving from God. Meditation is really meant to be passive, and it can be meditation on scripture, it can be meditation just on breathing, anything that calms you down, but we take out the active part that is prayer. Um, the Calm app, Calm Kids, there's an insight timer, there's different things that can be used in the classroom or at home that kind of guide kids through how to slow breath, how to calm down. Um, I am a big fan of hands-on things, all of the fidgets, all of the coloring, all of the labyrinths, there is this thing being marketed right now on Instagram, and they're called Calm Strips. Have you seen this? So they're these little strips, and you stick them on your computer, and then when you're anxious, you rub them. And then it's magical, allegedly. And they're expensive. Um, and what they actually are, though, are sandpaper. If you go to Lowe's and cut sandpaper into small strips and put some tape on the back, you just defeated the Calm Strip company. Um, but for kids who are tactile, for kids who need that kind of grounding, um, for kids who need something to fidget with that doesn't necessarily bring your classroom to its knees, it's a really good option and something to just kind of touch and work with and bring yourself back to the present. Um, I, my office is full of fidgets and squeeze balls and poppets and all of the things, and they disappear all the time. I'm always reordering them um, because the kids don't know what to do and they need it. 
and it's also something that they can have and touch and not have to look at you while they're talking to you, which is really important. Um, that's part of the reason why the comfort dog is so valuable, because the kids don't have to look at me while they talk to me. Are you bringing me flowers? That's very exciting. Oh, thank you. Can we clap for that? That's <laughs> I don't think I'm supposed to take them, but that's very nice. <laughs> All right. There's also a lot of breathing exercises out there that um, are good to teach the kids. Just And even if it's as simple as we're going to do some color breathing. I'm going to breathe in blue. I'm going to breathe out red. I'm going to picture it. I'm going to slow it down. It sounds very cheesy. These kids have not learned how to sit still. So as we're also helping them navigate what they're thinking, while we're talking about these hard things, before we go into it, we want to look at, am I communicating worry or wisdom? Is this real or fear? Are we panicked or are we based on principles? Um, and to help them build their narrative on it. And so to listen through it, to help them evaluate, to help them reframe. And then the big one is that stress is not a bad thing. They have been brought up to believe that stress is a bad thing and that stress is the same as anxiety. I think we're in a relationship now, if you're bringing more flowers. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yes, someone cares. Okay. She says, I bet she comes back with more. <laughs> stress is not a bad thing. Um, it's how the human race survived, right? There's a bear that is stressful. I don't want to be eaten. I better get out of here. The same applies today. I have a math assignment due. I don't want to fail math. I don't feel very good about this. I guess I better do it. Way back when, when the anti-bullying campaigns first started, it really backfired on us because it taught kids that anytime anyone hurts their feelings, they've been bullied, um, which is like a nightmare if you're a school administrator. But more than that, it made me really sad because it created all of these little victims who believed that anytime anybody said anything that they didn't like, they had to go get help or else they wouldn't be able to get around it. And so we had begun before the pandemic doing some really intentional work, starting with our sixth graders, on the difference between bullying and social drama. And are you really being targeted and picked on and this is out of your control? Or when I call this other child down, are they gonna have the same long list of things that you've said and posted that you're in here reporting about them? And we were getting there and we were getting good at it and the kids were able to identify it and self-regulate some of it. And now we're kind of starting over. <laughs> that makes me wanna cry a little bit. But I feel like our anxiety talk is starting to go down that same road where we're training our kids to believe anytime I'm a little bit stressed, I must have an anxiety disorder. I must have something that needs help. And it probably does need help, but not in the way that they're thinking. And so we wanna train the kids up with stress is about a problem. And if you need help solving that problem, you've come to the right place, I will help you figure that out. Anxiety is the feeling of something terrible is about to happen, but I'm not gonna tell you what it is. That's anxiety. And when you have a kid that comes in and has that feeling, that exercise of going through their lives is super helpful because we can narrow it down. Do you really have a problem or no? We have a chance here for the kids to really learn how to live in grace, learn how to develop some grit, and learn how to walk in faith. And a lot of that is our responsibility as their adults to guide them through it. Now that, now that this doesn't match my notes, I'm really winging it, you guys. Like, I have no idea what's coming next. I am just as excited as you are to see what's going to come up. <laughs> All right. But we will talk about toxic positivity versus gratitude. So the idea of having a gratitude attitude, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to list the things I'm thankful for, it's good. What it created in the last year and a half, though, was, well, if I say things are hard, then I'm being negative. And if I say that I don't like it, I'm not being a team player. And I just have to say that things are OK. And I will tell you guys, I see it in my kids. I see it in my coworkers. I see it in my family. There is a fear of the second that I am honest about how much this is not great, I'm bad. I'm not being grateful. I'm not living the way God wants me to live. I'm not counting my blessings. 
And that is really hard because it is hard enough to be human and have problems. The last thing we need is to have shame on top of it for how we feel, right? And so sitting with kids to say, yes, we can count your blessings and I want you to do that. I try to end every session with tell me something that's going well. Tell me one thing you're excited about. Tell me something that's good. But also, this is really hard. <laughs> like People are really burned out. And it's hard to be a kid, and it's hard to be a church worker. And we get to live in both of those statements. God is very good to me. I am blessed to be here doing his work. I'm blessed to be a part of the ministry. I don't like a lot of what has come with it lately. I don't. And I don't have to. I don't have to like it. I can still be grateful for the stuff that, that I do like. When we're talking about working with the kids, actually, I'm going to side note that. I had a kid in my office this week. His dad is dying. Um, his dad has cancer. It was in remission. It's come back. It's really sad. It's really hard. They're in palliative care right now. They're moving toward hospice. So we're a kid who is going through a pandemic with a parent who's already battled cancer, and now we're moving in toward kind of the end of it. The other part of it is his dad is really kind of awful and really was even before he got sick. And so uh, this kid was sitting with me. It just really reminded me of that because the kid was like, I love my dad. I hate being around him. I don't want him to die. I want all of this fighting to stop. I want to have a relationship with him. I don't think that's going to happen. And, and then to say to him, all of that is true. Everything you just said is your truth. He's hard to be around. He's not been very nice to you and your mom. It's been really scary at your house. It's sad that he's sick. It's hard that he's going to die. All of that is true. And so there's a lot of contradiction right now out there. And when we can sit with these kids and with our coworkers and with each other and with ourselves and say all of those things are true and not feel bad about any of it, we're going to be a little bit better off. When we are working with the kids and we talk about what are we looking for, um, We've covered, you guys, this is really, this slide wasn't even in there. I don't know where, what happened here. But this is a lot of what we've talked about. We can revisit the bullying and social drama. We'll see what's next. Here's my best statement for you. This is the best thing I have for working with kids. Do you want me to help or do you want me to listen? This is the most important question you can say to them. We have kids that won't come forward because they're afraid that the minute they tell you what's going on, you are just going to go gangbusters and start hauling other kids in, and people are in trouble, and you're calling home, and everything is now a thousand times worse. I always tell the kids, you know my rules. If you're hurting yourself or someone's hurting you, I don't have a choice. We're all mandated reporters, right? Beyond that, vent. I don't care. Get it out. It's fine. If you just want me to listen, if you want me to help, that's going to look a little bit different. I have a teenage daughter, so that's hard. She's super strong-willed, which is going to be great when she's out in the world, but right now it's all at me. Um, but this has saved my life on a number of occasions because, you know, I'm a counselor. And so she'll come in and she'll start telling me things that are going on and, and I'll start offering solutions and, and then she loses her mind <laughs> and rages out. And then I am, I'm afraid for a while until she calms back down. She's not that bad, but it's like the teenage years with girls. Oh, my goodness. So I really had to start opening with this with her. Like, do you just need me to listen? Are you just mad at your dance teacher and you need to go off for a half an hour? Or are you trying to wind me up so I rage in there? Because I'm ready to fight. Like, we can do that, right? But if you want me just to listen, then I want to give you the opportunity for that. So the parents, that's a thing. How many of you deal with parents a lot? Remember when they all thought we were heroes? Remember that like four month period when teachers could do no wrong because suddenly they were home with their own kids? It was so fun. Like I got stuff at work, I got thank you cards. I never get thank you cards. All kinds of things. We knew what we were doing, we were the experts in our field, we were the smartest, they didn't want to have anything to do with it. And then the tides turned, didn't they? And so I'm seeing though, the same thing with the parents, there's just no emotional reserve left. And so you're in mourning for all the opportunities that your kids have lost, right? And then you're also in a place of shame because 
Now we know what we know. Back then we didn't know what we knew, but we're judging ourselves against that standard, right? So I have parents who maybe let their kids go on a trip and the kids then got sick, or didn't let their kids go on a trip and nothing happened and they regret that. I have parents who raged at their kids when they were home because they were that frustrated and overwhelmed. There's a lot of shame involved with parenting over the last 20 months. And unfortunately, uh, as educators, I think that we're bearing a lot of that. Um, I really have tried when parents are coming in to listen more, affirm more. Sometimes I gotta dig deep to find something to affirm, but it's in there. Um, and, and try to take that shame off before we tackle the problem or else we just get spun up in circles. And so if I have a parent that calls me raging because the teacher didn't give enough notice about the field trip form, that's a fun one, I love those calls, the teacher didn't tell me. Okay, well everything's digital, like I know, I see it, it's right there, I see you read it even. But the teacher didn't give me enough notice about the field trip form. My kid can't go on the field trip. This is ridiculous. The teacher's out to get my kid. My kid's being targeted. Why is everybody so mean? Why does this teacher hate my kid? I've had problems all the time. I've talked to other parents. That's my favorite. I've talked to other parents. And so to step back, though, to say what's going on here is I've been really overwhelmed for the last year and a half. I've dropped the ball a whole bunch of times. I've watched my kid have a lot of disappointments. And now here's another one, and deep down I know it's my fault. That is a lot to unpack over a field trip form, right? So if we can start the conversation from the place of, I know you're a great mom. I know you're a great mom because you're this upset, and you want these things for your child, and I want to help you figure this out. Like, I really need to be on your team, okay? But I know you're good at what you do, and I know your kid loves you, and I know you have a good kid. It is a lot of affirming the adults right now, and it is the fastest way to help them dial down. We need to also help them figure out, we have to celebrate the wins with these kids, but the wins are gonna look different. It's probably not gonna be straight A's for the first time. It's probably not gonna be all of a sudden huge athletic gains. It might be coming to school every day for a week. It might be joining a club and talking to somebody new. We have to help the parents recognize that though because part of what's driving that shame is we have parents who are judging their parenting and their kids on a 2019 standard. And it's not 2019. And so the expectations of I'm going to have a kid who is a three sport athlete, who is in AP classes, who is also working a part time job is probably not possible. He's not there. He's trying to learn how to re-enter life and, and talk to a girl and turn in his homework and, and hold a structured day down. And so we really have to, and I'm not talking about we're gonna lower the expectations forever because that would make me wanna give up, but we, we have to just continue to re-enter. Um, and we have to help the kids learn that and help them learn that they're okay and they're on the right path. Um, we're, we're all overwhelmed. And so if we can start with acknowledging that, we start to get on the same team. Um, our parents are really fragile right now. They just are. And that also brings to, uh, what about us, right, as church workers? Because again, with the shame, and the thing that I love about church workers and those of us that are called into the ministry is that we will do anything for the ministry. We really will. The educators that I know will do anything for their kids, and they hold themselves to such a high standard. And a lot of us, same as the parents, are holding ourselves on a 2019 standard. The things I did in my classroom, the ways I handled my personal life, all of the things I was able to juggle, it just might not be possible right now. Um, we have a world that is armchair quarterbacking. Everything we do is your church service in person, online, outside, what are you doing? Because it's wrong, right? Um, are you requiring masks? Yes, no, you're wrong. You're just wrong. You know, did you ask anybody if they were vaccinated? It's wrong. Did you not ask them? That's wrong. It's all wrong, right? There's no correct answer to any of this. And there's a little bit of peace in living there that like no matter what I do, someone's mad, so okay, it's fine. <laughs> there's, no, there's no good answer anymore. 
Um, but that adds to, if you are a driven, maybe a little bit of a perfectionist, super dedicated to your mystery, ministry, knowing that you're here doing the Lord's work, the constant message that you're doing it wrong is really hard to swallow. And it's really demoralizing. Um, it's hard in church work, too, because our work is tied to our faith, right? It's what we do. And, and if we're doing it wrong, that's hard. We all have pandemic fatigue. I cannot believe I'm still talking about COVID, you guys. Um, we have these kids who are absent or checked out or avoiding school or avoiding us. We have parents who are spiraling. And like everybody else, we have zero emotional reserve. So when we look at thinking about what could have gone better, armchair quarterbacks, the work grind. I've been subbing. It's really fun. I love being back in the classroom for like 30 minutes. And then after that, I remember why I'm not in the classroom. Um, all of these things. So back to your friends that you made earlier talking about your pandemic experience. For yourself professionally, which of these is impacting you the most? Go ahead. That's good. Chat it up for a second. I promised we wouldn't do this a lot, but you guys seemed like you were having a good time, so I really wanted to bring it back. All right, guys, let's, let's bring that back together. <laughs> Isn't it fun to get together with people who are in the same boat and talk about how hard some of this is? <laughs> oh, it's nice to admit it. Um, so I, I apologize that I, I didn't have some of those slides up there. I, like I said, I am going to share them. You know, we talked about practical strategies. It is, I will send you links and activities, and, and all of that is in there probably more useful in the app than just looking at it up here anyway. Um, but I do want to talk about <laughs> my least favorite thing about going to counseling conferences is that they say self-care 70,000 times. <laughs> and I hate that term. I think it's terrible. Um, and, I, and I actually want to kind of get at that a little bit for, as church workers. I think that self-care, the way it's thrown around, and especially the way it is thrown around at, at essential workers right now, 
is literally the most gaslighting thing you can do. Um, because it, it's this idea of, well, if you take a bubble bath, or you find a hobby, or you go for a hike, or you start yoga, or you read a couple of good books, you will feel better. So it's in your control for you to feel better, and you're refusing to do it, is what that is. I hate it. I hate the talk about self-care. If getting in the bubble bath with a glass of wine solved the world's problems, I would have created world peace like eight years ago, you guys. <laughs> I promise. But it's not how it works. And if we knew how to just soothe ourselves, we would do it, right? But what has happened with self-care is it's being thrown at you as an excuse for why you can do more or maintain or not be upset or not acknowledge what's hard, right? You don't want to take on extra parking lot duty. You should take up yoga. You'll feel better. You don't want to give up all of your prep periods to sub. Take a bath when you get home. It'll sting less. It's hard. And so I really think that we have to start to turn self-care into what actually does that look like right now. And, um, and I, I'm an administrator at our school, so I'm not advocating for, like, just start refusing things, because <laughs> that would get back to my faculty, and it would be really hard. <laughs> but it does look like different boundaries. Um, saying no. Staying home when you need to. Cutting corners. Not responding to that evite that you're not super stoked about. It's okay. We don't have to do all the things like we used to do right now. We are in a state of fatigue. Um, but the best thing that you can do is live in some grace for yourself. Um, we, as church workers, are so good at giving grace to the people around us. We are. We can look at other people and say, we know you're doing your best, it's okay. And then we lay awake until three in the morning thinking about how three years ago when I did this lesson plan, it was amazing, but this year not so much, and so I should be really upset about it. And so if we are in the idea of, I did the best I could in the moment I was in with the information that I had and the resources that were available, I'm going to have a whole lot more peace. I didn't know six months ago what I know now. I didn't know a year ago what I know now. But I will tell you that every step of the way, even though I messed up, even though I was super imperfect, one of our theology teachers is here, and you're going to see her coming around in a second, and she can tell you stories about how imperfect I am and what a train wreck it is sometimes. It's fine. It's, it's okay. But I did the best I could. I know I did in the moment I was in with the information that I had and the resources that were available. And I feel like that... That is what self-care looks like right now, is just being able to say that and believe it and let it go. Do you want to start passing those? So this is Anna. Isn't she great? She did not bring me flowers like the other lady, but that's okay. Um, so she's going to give you a QR code. I want to talk a little bit about, and you can share them. That's cool. I don't know how, if I printed enough. We talk about checking in with the kids, and I, and I use some digital check-ins, and we do some different things. We can check in with adults this way, too. If you are looking at trying to figure out how a large number of people are doing, if you have a congregation you're looking after, if you are in leadership at your school and you're not able to actually make contact with everybody every day, these are some really great ways to do that, to go in and say, how am I feeling today and what's going on? And then the most important thing comes at the end, who do you want to talk to, right? And these are super easy to create. This is just through Google. Um, we actually use a system called Qualtrics for our suicide screening because I can't risk a student impersonating another student on a suicide screening, and so that solves my security on that. Um, for stuff that's a little less urgent, this is great. And then you have that data, and you're able to go in and say, these are the kids that answer that they're struggling socially. These are the adults that answer that they're struggling financially. These are the teachers who are requesting check-ins and kind of work to do that. Now, the last question on that survey, if you're doing it, I hope you are, it's super fun, is if you want to stay in touch with me, uh, if you want to talk further, if you want to exchange info, I really think that I made it not required, but if I made it required, that is really awkward if you don't want to stay in touch with me. <laughs> so you can just say no, it's fine, if you have to. And thank you, Anna, for doing that. Um, one of the things that we did while she's doing that at Faith to try to support our teachers. I'm out, okay, it's okay. You can find people with the QR code, they'll help you. Um, 
one of the things that we tried to do was cut back on the stuff that uh, is draining. Admin took a lot of supervision duties over. Um, we let go of a lot of scaffolding and staff development expectations just to kind of try to create some time and create some space. Um, which I, I feel like was really well received by our teachers, but then it fell on administrators to figure out, well, how are we gonna relieve some pressure for each other? And, and what that really came back to was, we did the best we could. I'm gonna acknowledge that in you. I see you beating yourself up over that call that you made when we didn't know what we know now. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take care of telling you, you were okay and, and you did a good job. All right, so you have your check-in surveys. That is super fun. It says that it what? <laughs> oh no, I've never had Google reach a limit. You guys, I have exceeded Google today. It's the QR, oh no, it's the QR. Man, all right, I'll try to figure out how to put that into the app too. As you can see, technology stuff is not my, it's not my gig. I really need a handler for it. I was proud of myself that I loaded the slides in and even that didn't quite go well. Um, I will get that, that survey in there to take a look at. It's pretty simple, scale of one to 10, how are you feeling? A lot like what we worked on. And then also, who, who do you wanna talk to? So this is Esther on our campus. I love that picture because she looks really smug that she found some friends. Um, I love that picture so much that it's actually on the cover of my book that I wrote about Esther and I brought a couple of those. Again, I didn't get it together to put it in the bookstore, but if you're interested in hearing more, I have that available. Um, if you did not get the QR code, but you have a desire to be in touch, please let me know. Please hook up over, over the app with me and we can talk further. And um, we're gonna end early, which I think is always fine because there's a lot of food here, right? There's a lot of stuff to eat. Um, I do want to close us in prayer though before we go any further. Lord God, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gift of this day and, and the gift of this conference and the gift of the chance to come together. Uh, this work is hard and this ministry is hard and you have blessed us with a lot of little people to take care of and a lot of big people to take care of and we do it all in your name and we want to do it well and so I ask that you just really fill cups today and tomorrow and that everyone leaves here just energized and, and ready to go and do your work. I thank you for the chance to come together and I thank you for the chance to meet new people and I ask that you bless everyone's travels coming and going in your name, amen. All right, and I'm here if you have questions. I won't do the big group questions because that is really awkward, but I'm up here if anybody wants to talk. So thank you.